Well, hello, everyone. It's our final session. Oh my gosh, we got through it um, a whole year. And I feel like, and a little more, I just feel like we've been together for a long time. So, um, but you all did it. You have all graduated. At the end of this session, you have all graduated. Um, and um, as I mentioned before, the packages are going out or have been mailed. Um, and one of the things you will be receiving is, and I don't think it's the bronze one that I thought I had, but you'll receive a little pin like this that says, you know, developing leaders and also your certificate, your physical one, um, and then some Nyla goodies as well. So thank you, Annalie and Lauren here at the office for making them look all pretty and nice. So those are coming to you um, at the addresses that you sent over to me. Um, and as I mentioned before, and I've sent in the email, our run of show is that, you know, we're doing team introductions right now, team and the team advisors. Um, team Novel Idea will go first. There'll be a Q&A for them afterwards. Um, then Team Marigolds, and then Team Forward Thinking, and then Closing. And we will take a little group photo, even without your certificates um, for social media and the like. Um, and then you have graduated. So it's so exciting. Welcome. Um, and... And to introduce the teams and our advisors, because one of our advisors is here right now, um, Team Novel Idea, um, their little blurb was, as we are all reference librarians, we have noticed a disconnect between the 18 to 25 age group and the library and the basis of our project is essentially how to connect, correct that through programming, accessibility, collection materials, and community engagement. And their advisor is James Richardson, who is here, um, who is both a Nyla voice writer and also from the Huntington Public Library. Um, so thank you, James, for attending the session and seeing how this project has come to fruition. Um, and with that being said, I wanna jump into our presentations. So, um, oh, and Team Novel Idea is Colin from the New York Public Library, Jill from the East Hampton Library, Caitlin, from the Central Islip Public Library and Patricia from the Nassau Public Library. So give me one second if I pull up your presentation. On my end, I'm gonna share my screen. And if you wanna say out loud, like next slide, so I know, you know, to move, <laughs> I that'd be great. Excellent. And can everyone see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Take it away. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to start. I'm Jill, um, even though pretty much everybody on here knows who we are by now. Um, like C had said, we are doing our project on connecting to the new adult demographic. And what we've found out is that this generation came into adulthood today, has grown up with Uber and Lyft, YouTube, Snapchat, Instagram, a whole host of things available to them at any time and anywhere. People that are aged 18 to 30 today have always had food delivery, map directions, videos and music, and a cloud full of information always at their fingertips. And according to a 2021 Pew Research poll, 84% of people of this age group are using social media. And it shows with Instagram, Snapchat, and TikTok being the most prevalent. They were raised talking to devices, accessing apps, and posting online. This age group has grown up in a digital world and knows how to use it. A lot of them use the online world to create new companies, art forms, music and videos, nonprofit communities, and forms of communication. And the pandemic's influence on them cannot be overstated. Overnight, their entire lives were moved online and formative school years were suddenly moved to a Zoom world. Uh, this age group is very used to sharing with others, such as their Netflix passwords and Uber, even medical costs and a focus on what types of services offered is more important to them than say buying a car. 
as the world recovers from the pandemic. This age group looks into organizations who have mastered the art of digital transformation and who can offer them services in the midst of national emergencies so they can continue with their lives as normal as possible. And that's where the library comes in and maybe where we've always been. The library as a public institution is poised to capitalize on this to make it more enticing for the emerging adult to utilize our resources. It's important for the library to reach out to them in a way that would attract them. So dynamic social media posts are just the beginning. And how does the emerging adult know what the library offers if we don't tell them? And once we've got their attention, how do we keep it? This is where a resource like the website we've created comes in. We've created this resource tool that libraries and librarians can utilize to help create spaces and programs and bring new and exciting resources to the new adults. Please go to the next slide, see. So who are new adults? Uh, they're generally people that fall within the 18 to 30 age range and are generally called new adults because they're now tasked with figuring out a bunch of skill sets that are brand new to them. They've usually graduated high school and are enrolled in or graduated from college or have entered the workforce. They're working on becoming financially independent, moving away from home, getting married and or having children. They're looking for or starting a job related to their career and they don't usually have a space in the library. Next slide, please. So how does the library connect to that demographic? Get the word out and start with social media. Tell them about the services we currently offer and find out what more we can offer them by asking them directly. Expand your virtual reach, market your library in new innovative ways and this links back a bit to social media. It's very easy to make a simple post, but taking the time to make something that's more dynamic can attract many more viewers. Um, an example, if you're not already, check out and follow the Instagram page for the Milwaukee Public Library. They are a great example of a library promoting what they do, their resources and programs while making it fun and current. Uh, be a place this age demographic can come to think of as reliable. Uh, don't be disingenuous. This should be simple, but be upfront about what the library can do for them and actually do it and have resources ready and available to use. Uh, next slide, please. So We'd like to give you a look at what we created now so you can see how the work we did turned into this website. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Caitlin, as she discusses the website. Please hold as I get the link up. <laughs> Okay. All right. So as you can see, this is the website that we designed together as our team. So we took a lot of our survey questions and general information that we felt was the most important for librarians who are working with this demographic. So if you take a look at our toolbar, we have home, our patrons, accessibility, college and career resources, community engagement, library engagement, supporting new adults in their careers, young parent resources, LGBTQ resources, and travel resources. So we discussed within our own group that these are the most important things taking place in those 18 to 30 demographics lives right now. So see if you don't mind just clicking on the Our Patrons tab. So this goes into a bit of what Jill already explained, which is this demographic, because not every librarian may be well-versed in the 18 to 30 range. So we wanted to make sure that it was at the forefront of our website so that everyone did understand. So this is just a quick little blurb to give you a refresh. 
And then if you continue down, see and click on the accessibility tab. Same thing, we discuss here all of the resources that are available to this demographic if you continue down on the side. So we included a lot of different links to different resources, whether it be physical limitations, um, time constraint, which is a big thing in, you know, everyone's live at this state, you know, between college and careers for the first time. This is kind of where librarians can go to help direct people between Suffolk, Nassau, and New York Public, because within our group, we are a mixture of, you know, Suffolk County, Nassau, and the city. So we wanted to make sure we were able to reach all of those patrons. And then if you want to move to the College and Career tab. So the College Resources goes into a little bit more of all the information that could be helpful to them during that point. We also include below some college planning as they do begin this next journey for them. And then if you keep continuing down, we have career resources because as we know, not everyone may head to college right away. They may choose to join the workforce right away. So this also gives them some options into different employment centers between Suffolk, Nassau and Queens. And then if you continue up and this website is available to everyone. So if anyone after the presentation wants to click into these links more and learn a bit more, it is a live functioning site. So see if you don't mind just going to the community engagement tab. So this goes into a little bit on how we are going to increase that. This is going to be a spot where other libraries will be able to contact us, add in their success stories and what worked for them. So that's going to be a living document part of the page that'll be able to get edited throughout time. So that's why this page is a little bit empty right now. That's going to continue to go on as this site gains more traction. So library engagement's up next. So this goes into some tips and tricks on things that's really important for this demographic when it comes to engaging them, whether that be book displays, uh, social media driven things. Um, this is also going to be a spot, again, as more libraries get back to us, we can add into it things that have worked for them with their demographic if they have a really good hold on that 18 to 30 area. And then this goes into a little bit about their interests in their time because, you know, video games, board games, it's not just for kids. Many of us in adulthood still enjoy that. So we talk a little bit about that and the different educational aspects that are important to them right now. So then we go into the supporting our new adults in their careers. So if you scroll down a little bit, this goes into more job resources and things from ALA as well as a couple of other sites that provide resume help, job help, because a lot of the times we experience with this demographic is they're looking for help designing a resume, how to interview for a job, where to find these jobs as many things have moved online now since COVID. It's become a lot trickier, so this is a great spot for librarians to be able to reference back to to answer some of those niche questions. We also go through the financials because for a lot of us in that age range, you know, we're first getting on our own. We may not understand everything. This is another great spot for librarians to be able to go to reference and help those patrons that need things. Housing, again, we're all moving around in this age. So housing is definitely a really big need in this demographic. So we wanted to make sure we also included all of that, as well as some programming ideas of what we can do as librarians to support them during this uh, transition time in their lives. And then see if you don't mind just jumping to the next tab for me, the young parents. So a lot of the time this 18 to 30 demographic will be having children. They're looking to, you know, communicate and meet other parents of young ones. So this goes into more of those options for them, as well as some important resources for them, WIC, um, social services, special needs, how to navigate if you have a special needs child and some of the resources that are out there in Suffolk, Nassau and the city. And then see if you wanna jump to our second to last slide. LGBTQ plus resources is a huge topic right now in all of our lives. So we wanted to make sure that as librarians, we'd be able to find, you know, great resources that are tried and true to be able to supply to these individuals as they're navigating and discovering who they are in adulthood and learning a little bit more about themselves. 
And then the last thing that we included was travel. <laughs> Because, of course, 18 to 30s love to travel while they can, whether it's studying abroad for college or just choosing to take a gap year to experience the world. This goes into a little bit of those options that we can provide to them as they, you know, take on this new area. So, as I was saying, this is a living document website that we do plan to continue to update over time, whether it's all of us, one of us. We do hope that this will help a lot of our colleagues who are experiencing the same things we are when we're discussing and having these 18 to 30 individuals come into the library. Right. Ready when you are. Are we good? Yes. Uh, I was saying I am the lucky winner of survey question one. So I'm going to kick things off. In the survey that we did, one of the questions was, what challenges do you think libraries face when trying to engage the new adult age group? So prior to sending out this survey, we talked amongst ourselves to find out what we thought the concerns were and some of the problems and what we're trying to do to engage them. So we decided that it was attending college and not being local year round is definitely a hard point when we're trying to reach this demographic. They're constantly moving. A lot of us in that time period move from apartment to apartment, home to dorm, back home to college, and then also new parents. They're very limited in time. They have a young one they're taking care of. How can we reach out to them to keep them engaged in the library? So see if you don't mind going to the next slide for me. So after we received feedback and the responses and we looked through everything, we received 77 answers to this question from other librarians as I said, between Suffolk, Nassau, and the city. And it was discovered that librarians did not suggest moving often being a contributing factor as we did. More than half actually found that attending college and being new parents was the larger contributing factor. So two out of the three things we had did come up again and again in that survey. And then see if you don't mind hitting the next slide for me. So after receiving it, these are the four main answers that we got when we sent out this. Number one being most people in this age group are working or going to school, so timing of the program. So we have to remember for ourselves, not everyone is available days and everyone is available at night. We think a lot of times, let's have these programs at six o'clock at night after work. It could be that we do have this demographic available during the daytime because they're working a night shift. So it's not a bad idea to consider offering a gaming program in the morning or even the afternoon. For instance, you never know. Another answer that we found was adult services will frequently cater to the older age groups, typically that 55 and up retirement and have fewer programs for the younger age groups. So that's to say we have to remember just because that 55 and up is what we're normally seeing. Is it because we're not offering these other programs that the 18 to 30 generation might be interested in. And it could be that these programs do take a little bit more time to get off the ground and have an audience. Not everything's gonna draw 30, 40 patrons the first go. So it is okay sometimes to keep trying even if it doesn't succeed at first. Another option was the accessibility of information and materials online, as well as often for new adults, social interactions take place in circles outside the library. So that's basically saying not everyone is using the library and we can have things outside the library. There are some libraries that have had great success offering programs at restaurants and breweries and things like that, having book discussions. So it is something that more libraries could seek to do to meet this demographic where they're at. The new adult age group is also challenging because of college ages. Ones may not always be around due to being away at school or busy challenging class schedules as they are taking on this new area. 
Also, teens tend to lose their older teens. So that's saying that a lot of the times, once they age out of teen services, where do they go? We've done a great job making them comfortable in the teen department, but now how do we take them from the teen department into the adult side to retain them? So that all circles back to those other three answers in the timing of the programs, what we're offering, and sometimes continue to offer. If things are working great in the teen department, why not try them in the adult department as well? because we know they like it and because we've had them for four or six years, depending on the department. So see if you want to click to the next slide. So getting into this a little bit more, the programs that we offer, we can offer them during the college break, summer break, spring break, and really get into this when they're home from college. We can also change the hours, like we were saying, evening and daytime. Sometimes we can offer a program twice in one day in some cases to help scheduling. So next slide, see. The interactions that take, take place outside of the library, like we said, some libraries are already doing this. But you can also reach out to local activity centers, town clubs. You can partner with local businesses to create dual events where you're promoting each other. Promoting library newsletters outside of the homes. Sometimes dropping them off to a local laundromat or seeing if there's a daycare in the area where a lot of the patrons use. Having it available where they're already at can be a great option to let them know that the library is here, even if they're not looking at the newsletter from their home. And then next slide, see. And then at the end of the day, it's all about not forgetting that this demographic is with us. With much more of the focus being in the 40s and 50s, we have to remember that new adults do exist. So that could be creating a separate section in the newsletter, you know, 20s to 30s, 18s to 30s. It's also tailoring our book discussions, including some younger authors or including authors where the book is taking place during college years and things where our patrons can, you know, reflect and see themselves a little bit more in it. Like I said, taking a look at our teen programming and adapting it. And again, everyone loves games. It's an easy place for us to start. And then see, next slide. For that, I will leave off to Colin to take on survey question two. Thanks, Caitlin. Uh, good morning, everybody. Okay, so for our survey, uh, the survey listed four questions. For question number two, uh, we asked, in what ways do you think the new adult population uses the library or would use the library? Um, for this question, our team tried to understand the current user habits of our patrons. Why are our younger adult patrons coming into use our spaces currently? And so to answer this question, we followed two specific methods. First, um, we did a series of brainstorming sessions and did research on this topic um, and noting uh, several important points, which I'll point out in our, our next slide. Um, and then uh, also we consulted the expertise of our colleagues to identify areas of library interest for this user group, uh, specifically through our survey. Uh, next slide, please. So what did we discuss? Um, before we initiated the survey, we wanted to make, uh, have a general brainstorming session and to gather our thoughts amongst our team regarding the question of usage of the library. And so for this question, our team discussed trends um, and current professional discussions in regards to why our younger adult patrons were coming to use our, sp our, our spaces currently. And just some highlights that we pointed out. One was, so COVID has played a large factor in usage. Um, specifically in the last three years, um, ebook circulation has drastically increased, uh, especially since the beginning of COVID back in 2020, which, uh, Overdrive noted that it saw 430 million library ebook checkouts just in 2020 alone. Um, that is a crazy amount of checkouts. Um, and so in the, for this particular category, a lot of ebook usage has also then kind of continued on, I want to say, kind of in the post-COVID world that we're living in right now. And it's especially popular amongst the 18 to 30 uh, age group. So this is kind of something that's really uh, providing a great accessibility point for our patrons within this demographic, especially ones who 
may not be living at home, uh, going to college, still have their home library card. Um, and are checking out ebooks just for personal use or even for professional use as well. Um, uh, second highlight, uh, specific craft-based programming, including uh, uh, some things that uh, we've seen has been, you know, bro uh, board and brush programs, uh, do-it-yourself programs, um, diamond painting is something that's somewhat popular. Um, along with a, a wide variety of different type of art, uh, art and craft programs as well. Um, and one of the main driving reasons for this is that this provides uh, a moment of relaxation and reflection for a lot of these younger adult patrons, especially when it comes to everyday life stresses. So uh, one of the aspects of this particular uh, highlight is just the fact that a lot of uh, patrons within this demographic are utilizing the library for um, personal relaxation and for, uh, as in a sense, a de-stressor. Um, and of course, uh, another thing that is such a huge driver for us is uh, uh, programs that involve some for, some sort of food or drink component, um, uh, especially uh, when you have uh, Patrons who are of college age um, may not have city employment, and a lot of them will come to programs, specifically ones that uh, feature some sort of food or drink component. It allows them to uh, have a snack, take a break, uh, maybe gain some information that they may not known of, have known about before. So this is just something that's really uh, that's uh, integral to this type of program. Um, they also utilize us for uh, borrowing materials for test prep, especially for civil service examinations. Um, this is just something that we've we've all seen uh, throughout our systems that a, a lot of patrons, specifically those who may have graduated high school, may not be going into college or maybe only completing two years of college and are looking to enter into the civil service world. Um, they will utilize our space and our materials for test prep, specifically for uh, these types of exams. Um, and what kind of uh, the final point that kind of do dovetails into this is they also like to utilize the, the library space for studying um, as well as virtual programs as well. Um, and so the library then becomes a place for them to kind of, uh, you know, separate from the rest of the world. Um, and especially those who are working from home as well. Um, they will utilize uh, library space to um, get away from their home environment and allow them to either uh, utilize study rooms for specific uh, locations that offer them or even just a general open public space for them for themselves to use for um, whether it's uh, studying for a uh, professional exam, or whether it's we're running a business from home um, in order to get uh, a different uh, space to work in as well. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Um, and then, so kind of gathering all of this information, we also then wanted to uh, see what uh, professionals at our institutions were also thinking regarding this question. And the four main points that really took away from question number two was this. Uh, first, uh, meaning space. So there was an agreement on this. Many of our responders took note of the importance of the library as a space where adult users can simply find a quiet place to study, do work, or simply uh, meet new people in low key social gatherings. Um, also highlighted digital materials. Several respondents also mentioned the importance of eBooks, e books, and streaming services. These services would allow patrons to connect with our institutional collections, even if they can't come into our locations. And this is a huge key for us that we that we were able to take away from the survey is just the fact that, um, especially a lot of library users within this demographic are using the library in a different way. Um, if they are unable to come to programs, um, especially given uh, a lot of us have 
hours that might not be conducive to either their work schedule or school schedule, um, it allows us to connect with them because they can also sign up for uh, digital library cards as well, because all of our institutions offer a digital library card for our residents as well. Um, so this is, this is also a huge key for us. Uh, engaging parents. A few respondents noted the importance of engaging uh, parents of children who use the library. They mentioned some of their locations would work to engage parents while their children was in the library program. And, and this is something that's becoming ever more popular, um, not just within uh, libraries within New York, but in other areas as well, where a lot of um, adult and uh, reference librarians are attempting to provide a space for uh, caregivers of children so that they can uh, meet and have uh, low-key social gatherings, information sessions, while their children are participating in a children's library program. And then of course, uh, the fourth major point is just programming uh, tailored to meet their needs. Some respondents also mentioned the need to have programming that focused on you know, self-care, um, Personal, uh, personal reflection, uh, self-improvement. Um, and uh, as Caitlin mentioned before, uh, the, some of the most popular methods that uh, some libraries have been using is uh, utilizing bars, uh, pubs, and uh, food at programs for adults as well. Um, next slide, please. And, and these are just like some of the really like uh, main points that were uh, came out, and and some of these uh, responses are are really just very um, uh, poignant in regards to uh, some of these points that were uh, that were mentioned as a result of this question. Uh, one, uh, when I tell them uh, they could download our free eBooks and e audio books on our apps, um, they seem very happy and surprised. Although many still express a preference for print books. They also enjoy knowing that they can access our ebooks and e audiobooks. Maybe they're happy that there is a free alternative to Audible. I think they would, uh, they would love uh, using Learning Express Library um, uh, database to study exams and LinkedIn Learning uh, via Linda. Um, also, and, and this is one of the far more interesting responses that I came across when uh, going through the survey. It was. I'm always amazed when this age group is spending money on uh, book, ebooks, and Audible when they could be getting them for free either in hard copy or digital form. I think if many of them realized how easy it is to get a book or audiobook without even coming into the building, uh, they would sign up to use this service more. Um, also, uh, the college crowd uses the library to study if they're commuters, but they are no longer seeking reference assistance for projects. The library is merely a relative, relatively quiet space for them to work we almost never see the working age population. Um, just, and once again, you know, a, a lot of these quotes really kind of hit at those major points that I was uh, pointing out before. Um, and then also, uh, I think some programming could be more geared towards the 18 to 30 age group, uh, video games, trivia, non-alcoholic social gatherings, and be publicized in such a way that, that they might entice people to uh, of this age group to come to these programs. So it's uh, difficult, it's interesting, um, but you could really see that there's this, um, uh, there's really this interest to bring this uh, age demographic into the library. Now, next slide, please. So uh, once again, so how did our own observations uh, align with the survey respondents? Once again, uh, similar observations. So we noticed a trend amongst uh, responses um, and our research and professional experience, particularly in the areas of meeting space, engaging patrons, and utilizing ebooks and e resources. Um, you know, for one, providing a welcoming, inviting meeting space for people within this age group, maybe coming up with programming in which we could create either study halls or um, allow. Uh, to set aside a uh, separate space within our locations for these patrons to have a space that 
better as their own when they want to do, whether it's, you know, work related, um, uh, work related activities or studying, or maybe if they're possibly working on a group project with other people, just know that they can utilize the library space for these means. Engaging patrons. Um, once again, you know, we have to meet patrons where they are. Uh, that is, you know, make sure that we are adequately uh, publicizing um, e-resources, uh, e-books, e-audiobooks, um, uh, things also like Hoopla, um, and also engaging them with programming that allows them to feel like they are uh, invited and welcomed into our spaces as well. That the programs that we have are not geared towards, you know, the 55 plus age set, that really we want to ensure that those within this particular age group are uh, invited and welcomed into our spaces as well. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. And of course, takeaways. It was obvious to us that our colleagues uh, and our colleagues that patrons between 18 and 30 who are using libraries are taking advantage of our resources, both in person and digitally to improve their own workflow, personal life, and for leisure. For their work lives, uh, we are being utilized as spaces for study, technological education, as well as workspaces. And for their personal life, using our materials, both physical and electronic, and programs to improve their health, diet, and looking for ways to better their personal life and achieve their goals. For leisure, they are looking to develop hobbies, hobbies make social in connections, and use our materials, both physical and electronic, to occupy their leisure time. So you know, uh, many people within this particular age demographic are utilizing us for ways that we may not even be noticing as well. Uh, next slide, please. And then on to question three. So my colleague, Jill Salazzo, she'll be expanding on um, particularly this question and how we can expand the uh, services and improve um, our services to this particular age group. Thanks, Colin. Uh, next slide, please, C. So question three was what types of resources can a library provide that can entice this population to utilize the library more? And prior to sending out our survey, I would interviewed about eight colleagues that work with me at East Hampton Library, and they also fall into this age demographic. And I found that their responses that they gave were very closely aligned with the responses we received for our survey, in particular for this question. Uh, so this list represents the most common responses to the survey, and I uh, will expand on them more in the next coming slides. You might ask why at the bottom I've listed nothing, and it's because we did receive a few answers to this question in particular that said that they didn't think we could do anything to bring the new adult into the library because they already have everything they need in the palm of their hand. And hopefully you'll see that what we found with our survey and the resource site we've made, that that statement will be contradicted. Uh, so next slide, please. So here I'm going to expand a little bit more on library space. Uh, space in the library was actually the most often mentioned response to question three. And as Colin said before, um, very important. So the spaces requested came in several different forms. Uh, spaces dedicated to new adults, either in the form of community room space or a space specifically for them. Uh, the spaces should have tables, chairs, comfortable seating, whiteboards, access to USB ports and Wi-Fi. A library cafe or another space where they can access and purchase drinks and snacks. Several responses brought up the idea of a cafe space that can be closed off from the rest of the library and stay open later. Um, most people in this age group are working during open hours, so offering later hours, even if only one day, can give them an option. A library space that can stay open later. 
um, the ability to pick up materials after hours. Several responses mentioned offering a lockbox type situation, similar to what could be found at some stores these days that allows a patron to access their holds after hours by entering codes and an on-site social worker. And there are some instances of libraries where um, we found that on-site social workers are available, but that response came up enough that we think it should be expanded upon. Next slides, please. So programming was the second most mentioned resource to appeal to new adults after the library space. Um, so programming specific to that age group, programs geared around fashion, nightlife, music, street photography, and more. Cultural programming, programming on humanities topics, continuing education programs, and programs that address pr practical skills, fun programs uh, like book clubs, trivia nights, and crafts, health and wellness programs, programs in collaboration with community organizations, restaurants, et cetera, and located at those places. Programs targeted to specific communities like the LGBTQ community, the Latinx community, and more. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, programs, events, open forums where members of that age group can share their knowledge on a topic. That response actually came up a few times, which I thought was quite interesting. Identity-based book clubs um, like Black Men Read or the Queer Reading Club, those were two examples that were given in survey response question answers. Uh, museum passes and other discounted experiences, volunteering and networking opportunities, bus trips and specifically bus trips to obscure events or locations geared towards this age group. Leftist political programming presented in collaboration with trusted partners and that programming would be centered around topics such as abortion, communism, socialism, anarchism, and the like. And online programming like Colin had said earlier for those unable to make it in. Next slide please. So the responses that fell into this category of library of things slash makerspace slash technology focused a lot on the things available to this age group when they were younger. And this included things mostly offered to teen patrons, but that should be made available to all. Makerspaces and accesses, access to these spaces at more convenient times a library of things. And the most uh, mentioned items for library of things for this age group were garden tools and bakeware, access to new tech and software, making things like Canva Pro available to patrons to use, mobile printing and job and language related databases. Next slide, please. So, for promotion and collection development, and I kind of combined these two things together, the most generated response that fell under this category was social media presence. Uh, create surveys to find out what this age group is looking for from the library and promote it where they will see it. Promote the books and audiobooks and the online sources like Libby and others. Bring more popular books, authors into the collection, uh, books that are promoted on BookTok, books, Bookstagram, and things like that. Bring in more graphic novels, more university press books, and make an easier process to place holds online. And next slide, please. So these were some of the highlight, high, lights of the answers for survey question three. Um, so often people do not realize what the library even offers many times for free, just with the use of a library card number to access materials, trips, benefits. So just finding ways to reach that population about resources they can access on their own as they become adults and do more independently would be a help especially from new adults coming from families that didn't utilize the library when they were growing up. 
Uh, again, there's a response about spaces, private study rooms, quiet rooms, eateries, and working with local shops to host events outside the library. Uh, programming heavily targeting this age group. The majority of adult programming seems to be much more broad and many of the programs don't appeal to the ever busy 18 to 30 year olds and also offering resources that teach the age group practical skills and emphasizing our digital services, uh, like Colin said before. So next slide, please. I'm now gonna turn it over to my colleague Patricia as she looks at survey question four. Uh, Patricia, you're muted. Thank you, Paula. Okay. <laughs> now that everybody can hear me, uh, question number four of our survey says, was, what are some ways in which your institution is engaging the new adult user population in the library? For example, programs, resources, needs. I have the opportunity to speak to a few librarians before the survey even went in, but just to get an idea of what was going on um, inside the libraries. And here's some notes from those conversations. Next slide, please. Okay, so Syosset. Uh, Quinn Zajesta, who's a librarian at Syosset, um, I was able to uh, find out that. When there are traditional programs just don't seem to be working for this age group. The virtual programs during COVID were more successful. Um, the library had a successful virtual author program, which was a BYOB event. And since the attendees were at home, they could enjoy an alcoholic beverage. That's the ditch fest that the library personnel were not allowed to drink as they were on the job on the program that was on the development program. Another program that came out that was successful with this age group was a virtual tour of a tattoo museum in Manhattan. Honestly, I didn't know that we had a tattoo museum in Manhattan, but Jessica did and program. Um, she also had some other suggestions, partnering with a local coffee shop to have writing uh, program or shop, um, play Jackbox online, graphic novel book talks, themes. Um, for programs that could be pop culture, true crime, fantasy, what's trending on Netflix. Um, she mentioned checking the actors obscure for ideas. And then virtual in person programs are not limited to um, Syosset uh, papers. So, right, next up, slide, please. Okay, next up, um, I got the chance to speak to Deborah. With the Oceanside Library, and they held a program at Harriet Murray in Oceanside. They said it was well attended. Obviously, the patrons come in and over. The program included a tour of how the beer is made and a flight of beer samples. This gives us the opportunity to talk about the library as a member. Um, and she said one participant had witnessed something like this part of my life. And the library did some creative marketing and made posters with their information on how to connect with the library, gave them to um, the owner, and whenever somebody came up to the bar and ordered something and they put a poster out, there was the library's uh, information. Uh, maybe, you know, we put the program together so as to make do something unexpected and leave something behind. And I really think that's a great way to do marketing to show the library's offer. Um, she said two other programs that were successful was a jewelry program and a trivia night called at a local club. So we're kind of starting to see, at least from Oceanside, uh, you're stepping it up. Meet them where they are. And obviously, some of these programs are meeting uh, this particular age group where they are. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, Uniondale Library. Uh, well, they've been doing programs for this specific age group since before the pandemic. Their large age department does handle the program transition from YA to adult. Uh, Uniondale is very strategically placed at Posture and a fine Mr. and West Community College. There are 
lot of those students are in their own area. Uh, Patricia, um, are you able to um, unmute and like reconnect your audio? It's just a little muffled. Um, is that a little better? Uh, it's kind of same. Okay. okay. So back to um, you. So their website, Events Calendar, has a area specifically for new adults. Um, they offer a variety of programs such as lingo, um, made that to you by students at class, and Oja, um, book club taking classes, and just recently, in 2022, they have what's called personal study rooms called Wiggle Rooms. Uh, these are quiet spaces. It has a stool, a desk, charging station, lighting, and privacy. And the library is receiving a grant from representative Taylor Dollar study rooms and the extra money. So, so these are things that I found out prior to this event. Next slide, please. Okay. So our survey results for question number four. Of the 77 people who responded to our survey, we received 71 responses to question number four. And those responses range from no program to having some programs. Uh, some answers were converged while well, others were very detailed. Some like to talk to programs that work, some programs that didn't. Some said that between creating programs for children and teens and adults and everything all the works, it wasn't much time, if any, for the new. Five. Thank you to everybody who responded to our survey for giving honest answers. Next slide. Okay, so here's the top answers, top responses to our um, survey. This is based on 71 answers. So 42% of programs are libraries have programs. They weren't really specific in what they said their programs were, they just said programs. Libraries with meeting space, quiet reading spaces that may have 30% of the time. Libraries with craft, video, or board games, virtual, in person. Sorry, Patricia, um, to interrupt you one more time. Yeah. Um, I'm going to send you um, over a phone number that you can call. So it'll be a little bit easier to hear you, especially because we want to hear these statistics. Um, so give me one second. I think this might help. Okay, so you can call that number I just sent to you directly in the chat. Thank you all for your patience. I just want to make sure that we hear Patricia.
Okay. So Patricia's still having trouble with um, connecting to the phone. So um, I'll just have you all just keep on going. It's only five more slides, um, but we are running a little over. So um, we'll just shorten the Q&A portion a little bit. Perfectly fine. Yeah, thank you. All right, Patricia, we tried. <laughs> you keep on going. Um, okay, so back to my uh, my uh, slide with the pie chart. Um, so, eighteen percent of our responses made up uh, libraries with craft, video, or board games, whether it's virtual, in person, or just clicking them. Eight um, percent of libraries uh, did not respond um, to this uh, uh, question. Then eight percent of libraries said they had no problem. Uh, and then we got into a little bit smaller amount um, of responses. Libraries who mentioned social media and Instagram, 5%. Now, what's interesting there is maybe by the time they got to question number four, um, they were kind of like, well, we already talked about social media. First three questions, um, we did have more responses. 3% of libraries mentioned that they had bought site programs. You know, spoke to each other. Movie share and trivia share. 3% uh, of the responders said that they feel that they needed to reach out to the community to help meet the needs. Nothing really specific, but just saying that they felt they needed community um, engagement. 3% had libraries with book clubs, and only um, one mentioned. Um, only 1% mentioned um, living. Um, but I think that in the other questions in our survey, living and social media um, mentioned. Next slide, please. Okay, so to follow up on some of the libraries who did, who did give responses and weren't very specific about their programs. I reached out to a couple of those libraries. And Colin Henderson works at the West County Free Library. He's the art gallery and ESL liaison to the library. And this is what she needs. Two of my colleagues and I have been running new adult books for almost a year now. And we have tried a few different program types with varying levels of success. What we found works best is planning programs at places in the area where the young adult demographic already visits. So far, we have run bingo at a local brewery and anywhere from 20 to 30 people each time. As we go forward, those are the types of programs we're trying to plan for. Things that are cheap or free to run at a venue outside of the library. No kudos to Colleen and the team at West Hampton Library. Um, just a I understand libraries don't necessarily want to go drinking with their programs, and I don't think that we are, but if we're going to meet the kids where they are, these are some of the things that they like to do. Colleen has uh, shown us, um, and that is what I want. So, Colleen, Colleen, West Hampton Library. Next slide, please. Okay, so I contacted Elizabeth Carroll. She's the um, digital services. Uh, librarian at Bellmore Memorial Library in Bellmore. And on the first site, it's she has a library page that has its own web page. I told you it's the information and collections. There's a link there if you want to find library pages. And then this is like what well, this is very interesting. We also have a deep tested digital library site that I put together fun nerdy rainbow collection. Last I checked, we're the only library that Something like other libraries have podcasts and blogs, but nothing that was a whole curated blog post. So I decided to share their um, digital library things, and she has listed things as podcasts, book list shelf, book list shelf care, Marlon and Jake and Dead People, Guardian Books, Penguin Podcasts, Book Nerds, NPR Book of the Day. Uh, she's got a number of websites. Uh, book Riot from there is true. Um, Mixed is exist to champion ambitious and inspire 
be writing and to share through their thoughts, but thinking about where to go and how to think of them. Um, site for for the million Instagram Library of Congress is a wonderful library, that museum library, um, and a variety of other really a tool that she posted on her website. And I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like this on on anybody else's website, and none of the responses mentioned something. You know, so this is a path to go on in the library. Next slide. Well, here's our reflections on page, which I think I'm not sure if Jill or Kate will go into uh, do this, um, but my last slide on the question number four, um, which kind of Goes with the other questions in my survey uh, was I think there's a number of libraries who are out there doing things. Um, I hope that other libraries will see this and say, hey, you need to think about it. Let's let us do the process. But this is our touchstone and reflection and success of the page. Um, so, as I said, I'm not sure who's exactly going to talk about this. Actually, Colin, I believe, was going to uh, quickly okay. give our reflections and assessment. Okay. Uh, thanks, Jill. Um, so basically, uh, you know, we just threw out a lot of information at you. So thank you. Um, but uh, the heart of this information is this. What was the main focus? What's the goal of this project? And it was to create a point of reference for New York-based librarians to creatively think of ways to meet the needs of an important audience. Um, to present the site is not just merely the work of the four of us, but rather is the, also the contribution of the insights of, of all our colleagues who participated in the survey. And also to establish a way for Nyla and, uh, and or individual librarians to advance the work of this resource, uh, basically in the style of a wiki. So that our hope is that the future of this resource lives beyond the, lives beyond this particular project, because as librarians, we know we don't have all the answers. Uh, but what is our greatest power? Our greatest power is ability to search and to find the right answer and to rely on colleagues to help fill gaps. Um, you know, we obtained a lot of information from this. Some of which, you know, uh, we had known through our own professional experience, but then also highlighting other areas in which we uh, we may not have seen or maybe we didn't realize before. So there was a lot of aspects of this particular project that was that were eye-opening. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, we enjoyed working with the wide variety of colleagues from different areas to create something that is beneficial to our own, own workflow in a tangible way. And although there were hiccups along the way, we feel confident that what we have created will be used by our peers and may provide the spark needed to create something new and exciting for the new adult age group. And last slide, please. And here is the site again. So once again, thank you everybody for listening to our presentation. And we really hope that, you know, you definitely check out this resource. Um, the three colleagues that I worked with to put this together, they put a lot of hard work into this and I am extraordinarily thankful for them, so. Thank you, everyone. Ooh, thank you. All right, so we have time for like a few questions and then we'll hop over to Team Marigold. So any questions on to Team Novel Idea? And you could just, you know, Unmute yourself. We all know each other at this point. I had a question. Um, the survey responses, do you have demographics on who responded to that? Um, I'm not sure if I maybe missed that, but was it people in this target age group or was it library professionals or what? So we sent it out to library professionals and it was a variety of libraries between Suffolk, Nassau and New York public system as well. So it definitely was across a wider age range, not just the 18 to 30 demographic, but more so those who work in that area. 
I have a question. What, what did you, what was the thing that you guys found most surprising out of the survey results? Did something really strike you as you were shocked to, to hear that? I think um, the, for me personally, the library space, because we don't see them in the building. So it, we everybody kind of gets the idea that maybe they don't want to come to the library anymore. Um, but the fact that they really want a space that they can utilize in the library was uh, is exciting to hear. I, I dovetail Jill's, uh, Jill's point. It, it's, it's the fact that like, you know, um, especially when they do come in and you do ask them these questions, more often it is because, you know, oh, I'm studying for this big exam or, oh, uh, you know, I, I work from home and I need another space to, you know, uh, to w do my workflow or something like that. And we just don't, um, I, 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 at least I can only speak on my experience. And that is like, we just don't pay attention to that. You know, that's, that's something we should be paying attention to. And it's something that maybe uh, we may have overlooked in the past. As a former director of a small library, I would echo that the way that my experience with the young adult, like the, the young adults, was that they avoided the desk and talking to the librarians. They came in like under the radar, used the Wi-Fi. They wanted us to set it up so that they did not have to interact with us. They liked the self-checkout. They liked like they just, they really were avoiding us hard, but they were using the space, mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah. they were avoiding us hard. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. You guys did a great job. That was a lot of work and you did a really fantastic job. Thank you. Thank you. James, I saw you unmute yourself. Did you want to say something? James was <laughs> the advisor. So. They, did, they did a phenomenal job and it was just amazing seeing it start out as an idea and then them, you know, meticulously put it together. And I wish in so many graduate courses that I had a group like that to work with myself. So that's all. Any other questions for Team Novel Idea? Awesome, well, thank you, y'all, you did it. Awesome, okay. So we're gonna turn over to Team Marigolds um, and their little blurb is, what's one of library things, a list of guide of things that might not be familiar or traditional loaning materials that libraries have to offer. Example, seed library, in instrument collection, museum path, or story wall kits, and so on, et cetera. Um, their advisor was Alana, who couldn't join us today. Um, and the team members is Beth from the Newark Public Library, Tamley from the Un Uniondale Public Library, Rita from the Brookhaven Free Library, and Jessica from the Warner Library. I'll turn it over to you all. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, so I want to make sure. Oh. Oh. Um. Okay, so we already got our introduction, so I'm just going to go straight to it. Can you please go to the next slide? All right. Why a library of things? In the wake of the growing trend of adding non-traditional items to library collections, it is Team Marigold's goal to develop a workable blueprint and how to implement a library of things, the toolkit will provide resources for libraries of all sizes to consider when developing their library of things. The toolkit will include will detail how to organize collections, manage materials, material examples, possible resources, and promotion of collections. Next slide, please. All right, this is a map of library of things that I got off the internet. And although the concept of library of things is fairly new to me, apparently it isn't. It's been going on throughout the United States in different libraries. So this is just a map. And if you see the different um, items that could be loaned or a part of their library of things, and this is the map of the United States. So go to the next slide, please. Materials, next slide. So while I was doing research, I did research with a number of libraries on Long Island and um, throughout uh, New York. So some of the things that I realized and I found out that the library of things sometimes are 
separated in different categories, or you could um, sort the list. So I put a different a couple of different categories on, and I just put some things that I thought were interesting. So some of the libraries have indoors and outdoor um, games that you could borrow. But this is by no means a complete list. This is just some of the things that I found that were interesting. Some libraries loan out bocce ball sets, croquet sets, cornhole games, Nintendo switches, and they have things for the home, a stud finder, cake pan, thermal leak detector, garment steamer. So when I was talking to patrons in my library about different things and about library things that they um, noticed that other libraries have, one of the patrons said that this is a good way to try out something before making a good purchase. And I thought that was very valid because I actually purchased something that I did check out at a library of things. So you could do a lot of different things with a library of things. Well, you could borrow a lot of different things. So these are for something for hobbies. They have a metal detector, binoculars, a jewelry toolkit, a sewing machine, and technology. Different things fall under technology. But these are the few things that I thought that were very, very interesting because a lot of these uh, library of things materials are actual big ticket items. I apologize if you hear background noise right now. Right now we're conducting a class visit, so you might hear it. So I really apologize. It's a really busy morning here. So one of the things they have are virtual reality sets, a digital microscope, which I didn't even know existed, a GoPro camera, a digital film scanner. These are some of the things. We could go to the next slide. Entertainment and auto. So here's a podcast equipment bundle, a vinyl record player, which is really cool because not a lot of people have these things anymore. A projector that could be used indoors or outdoors, a karaoke machine, things for your automobile, a Garmin GPS, a car code reader, an air compressor, and a portable car charger and jump starter. So all of these things are things that are included in the library of things. Now, you might not start off this big or might not start off with something that are, are as expensive as these, but these are just a few things that they do offer. Okay, next slide, please. All right. So these are different links to library of things throughout um, New York. So some of them are larger than others. Some of them have a little greater budget and others are smaller. But one thing that I did notice that some of the libraries did include things that they already owned already. Like someone had a VHS DVD player. So some of the things that are included were things that the library has already owned and now they're allowed to, um, they, now they agree to loan them to patrons and some other things they don't own. But this is just a, not a, a small list of libraries throughout New York that you can click on the link if necessary to see what they own and you can see how they um, label, list, categorize their information. Next slide, please. I believe this is going to go now to Ms. Jessica. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk really quickly about management of a, uh, a library of things in your building. And obviously, this is going to be different for every library, but um, you want to make sure to have to address a lot of these organizational concerns. Um, um, a lot of these are how you think about your library of things. And then um, we'll talk a little bit more about um, how you manage it in your building. So when you're starting the library of things, you kind of want to focus on what kind of items do we want to lend. Uh, as Tamalee was saying, there's a very large uh, menu of the things you can have in a library of things. And um, so defining first what your library wants to focus on is a great first step. If you just go into it as we're opening a library of things and so we're just going to buy all of this stuff, then you're going to um, have some troubles. Um, then too, I think it's very helpful to de define early on what department or person will be in charge of lending the items, if this is going to be a reference service, if it's going to be behind the circulation desk, um, answering those questions um, before you start will help. Um, and then more into policy things, you have to consider what are the risks of lending these items. So say you do lend something like a fishing pole and somebody uses it and they go into your you know, local 
lake or river and they fish and they don't have a fishing license and then they say oh it's the library's fault because i thought the library let me this fishing pole so i was allowed to fish um so you have to have a concept of what the library li library's liability is for these things and what kinds of permissions and uh rules you want to have in place and then so lots of these policies which is the final question how can policies limit these risks is the way you want to look at it um, these questions, I have a tip here that should you should brainstorm these answers with multiple staff members. This will firstly create buy-in and help generate more ideas. So if you're um, in the beginning stages of developing a library of things, I think it's a great idea to have a large department meeting and um, kind of consider all of these aspects. Um, so policies, what policies should you have in your um, in your library when you open a library of things. So a general library of things policy, this is gonna look very similar to your library circulation lending policy. It's gonna have rules on what's selected, how things are de uh, um, how things are removed from your library. Um, it's gonna talk about how long things are lent out for, who's in charge of it and stuff like that. Um, and you can very easily use your current circulation lending policy as a guide to developing that policy, and just making it more particular for your library of things items. Um, and then item specific policies. So like I mentioned about the fishing poles, they'll have a different rules from a baking dish. Um, you know, that it might be that fishing poles have to be returned with all of their hooks and a baking dish has to be returned clean. So you might need to um, use different ideas um, for different items. Fee schedules. It is useful to have a separate fee schedule for reference um, as well as for general information. So if you do lend out, say, baking dishes and somebody returns it without having cleaned it, does that require a cleaning fee? If somebody lends out, say, um, a virtual reality headset and they return it and it's completely uncharged you have to charge you have to spend a lot of time at the library charging it before you lend it out to the next person do you charge or do you um, uh, have a fee for charging um, so different stuff like that um, and then liability concerns some library things items might have specific liability issues uh, like wi-fi hotspots as you know um, if somebody logs into your library's wi-fi there's you know that release page that they usually have to walk, they have to agree to, that they're not gonna use the Wi-Fi for any illegal activities and so on. And that kind of releases the library from um, liability. And so for Wi-Fi hotspots, it would be the same thing, that they would have to release the library from liability if they use the item in an illegal manner. Um, if you're doing this as a part of a larger library, you might wanna consider consulting with a lawyer about the library's responsibilities. Um, and that's kind of a very quick guide to the four main things that you should think about when developing your library of things policies. Um, some of these libraries, I think that Tamalee are linked to them already. Some of these libraries have really good policies in place and this these links will all be live on this when it's shared. So you guys can click on those and go through them. Um, and then staffing and management. <laughs> So libraries should decide, as I said before, on a particular person or department to be in charge of uh, the administration or organization of your library of things. This just helps um, with organizational continuity. So you don't want, you know, somebody just goes into the back and checks out your bocce ball set and then doesn't count the balls and there's three missing. So um, you want to make sure that there's people in charge of it. Um, one great idea that I saw at several libraries was to create a manual of check-in and check-out procedures for each item, which I have on the next slide. So say you're checking something out, then you have to go through that item, make sure all of the parts are included. If they have to do sign um, some kind of policy or uh, liability release, then that should be included in the procedure. Um, check in, what parts need to be checked in? Do you have a checklist? Do the items need to be checked in in a particular condition? If it's a baking pan, is it clean? Is it, if it's, you know, a steam cleaning vacuum, is the water canister empty? Stuff like that. Um, and does the kit need to be restocked? So if it's something like a fishing pole or a fishing kit, is, are, are all the hooks still available? 
do these items need to be refilled? If they do need to be refilled, which staff member is in charge of that? Who should be notified? Um, and then storage is also always a concern in libraries because all of our buildings are very old and have limited storage. Um, so you should define where the item is stored and who, if there are issues with the item, where should it go? Who should be notified? If there's an item is broken, you don't wanna put it back with the regular items. Is there a place in your library you wanna to dedicate to uh, items that need repair or need to be replaced? And then should it be stored in particular condition? If you're lending out things like instruments, do they need to be um, unstrung or strung in a different way? Should they be stored right side up or upside down? All of this information you can include in a helpful manual that should be kept if you're keeping it at your reference desk, at your reference desk or at your circulation desk or with the library of things, just for easy reference for your staff and for patrons. Um, thanks. Okay, hi everybody. We're moving right along um, and continuing with what Jessica and Tamily have stated. We're gonna go into the management of materials. So um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Okay, so the biggest, biggest thing um, with uh, materials management is space assessment. Does your library have space? Where are you gonna store your materials? And speaking of space, what does your community need? So in order to figure out all of that with your library of things, um, if you look over to the right, our first thing is you need to coordinate from every department, coordinate with every department in the library because your library of space um, might not have any space, such as mine. We're in a really small, small library. So um, if you're um, planning on using a rolling cart or you might have um, uh, a garage or a storage unit in the back, um, you know, every department needs to know where these are located, who can borrow them. Number two, um, very, very important is the community needs ass assessment. First and foremost, what do, what does your community need? And you know, keep it small. Number three, keep it small. Um, start small and and see what your community needs, and then you can grow upon all of those items. Um, you want to keep all the costs in a spreadsheet, and um, to uh, to continue with with that spreadsheet, knowing if you have to. Um, buy something or, you know, add to what you had in case it was used or, or lost or, or, you know, not uh, given back, you have that spreadsheet so you know how much um, each item costs in case you have to replace it. Number five, you want to create a mark record with an enticing description that everyone can see. Um, this way, you know, just like they're going into your, your catalog to see what books you have, have it on there as well so that um, everybody sees it and knows that these items are available. Um, number six, check in and check out should only be in one place, um, you know, preferably your circulation desk um, and all materials should be checked in and checked out at that one designated place. Um, and if you do have space, create a display doesn't mean it has to be those items that you're displaying it could be really nice pictures of those um, items and uh, it, just make it nice and make it um, where people want to uh, use that item um, and number eight funding grants fundraising donations um, you know you don't only have to buy the materials, you can get a grant, you can do some fundraising. Um, and a lot of people donate items. They might have bought two vacuums and they're gonna donate you the second vacuum. Um, if that, if it was a donation, just let the person know, make an agreement that um, the library has the right to use this item as it is. 
and um, and uh, yeah, it could all run really smoothly. So if you wouldn't mind the next slide, please. Okay, continuing on with our management of circulation. So um, you should have a library of things agreement. When circulating library of things, make sure that your patrons sign something. Um, so if you look over to the right, this is the, um, an agreement. We took bits and pieces from um, other libraries and we tried to put one all together. You're more than welcome to, to use this in the future if you need, um, but um, it's just an agreement stating that I agree to, the, the patron agrees to accept full responsibility for those materials. Um, and we didn't, the next one is, uh, to pay a late fee if it's not um, returned on time. And, you know, that depends on what the item is. Um, it, it depends on your library, what you agree to, to, to have um, um, a, a cost per day. Um, and I accept full financial liability for the material and all the accessories while in my possession. There's so many different types of materials that you can loan out, um, but a lot of them come with different accessories. And if you, um, if a patron takes on that responsibility and they don't bring back one of the accessories, that whole thing doesn't work. But the good thing is you can always buy just, whatever goes with it. You don't have to purchase the entire item. Um, let's see. I agree to return Library of Things material to a staff member inside the library. That's really important. You can't just leave it in the, or throw it in the, the book job. You can't just um, leave it out front because um, each person has to really go through the items to make sure all the items are returned. And of course, down at the bottom, patron would write their name, sign their name. You do need their email, their address, their phone number, and whoever did the checking in and checking out should have their uh, staff initials down at the bottom because somebody has to be held account accountable um, to make sure that all the items were returned together because what happens is person who takes it out the next time, if the items aren't in there, we need to know um, how to track down those items. Okay, uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. And these are just um, some uh, materials management tips. Um, uh, we believe to try to stay away from legalities, manage repairs and cleaning after every single checkout, um, every single um, um, material that you loan out should have a clear set of directions that every staff member should know how to use um, because you're going to get the questions, how do I use this? Where can I plug it in? Can you show me how to use this? So that's really important. And um, lastly, that maintenance on these materials is really consistent. So who are you gonna hire in your department to, to maintain those items? Um, there is a lot that uh, goes into it. So you need a, a person or people to really um, maintain what you are loaning. So, um, um, all right, let's go on to the next slide and we're gonna keep going with, I think it's Beth. <laughs> Yep, it's me. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. So this is our last part, um, promotion and outreach. I think we already did about 20 minutes, so I'll just go through through pretty quickly. Uh, so next next slide. So just like anything else, you know, social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and um, we're going to see a TikTok too. If you if you want to do TikTok, can be a great way to promote your library of things. And um, a tip, just by following other community organizations, resharing what they've already shared and um, responding to things, that's a way to connect with your community and connect with other groups that you could potentially do pro uh, partnerships with in the future and programming with in the future. Um, so next slide. So um, social media trends, you can also try to follow 
different trends. If there's a certain day, you know, happy Memorial Day, and then you, you put something that's related in your library of things. Um, and then during National Library Week, the American Library Association has specific images that you can, can work with. So following these trends, people might already be looking at these tags and these searches. So that can help more people, more people see the content you put out. Um, next slide. So I did some research into different libraries uh, around the world and what kind of uh, social media they were putting out. So here's some examples. Uh, you can see that images are big thing. These were some of the popular, <laughs> popular ones. So you can see what uh, has people looking. Uh, images, you have your easy link to your to your um, item and how to check things out, your hashtags um, to make sure that it comes up in searches, and um, images of the items that can be checked out as well. So those are, are some things that we saw libraries doing that were popular there. Um, next slide. <laughs> and then here's Instagram, uh, again, images of the items or uh, images, you know, this this is cute, I think. <laughs> they made images like using Canva or some other free graphic designer. You can kind of show people easily what can be checked out. Um, crutches, that's an, that's an interesting one. Uh, next slide. So, um, you know, with the, especially with the younger generation, you know, TikTok's very popular. So here's an example <laughs> that uh, was done. You could have play. I don't know if the sound of them there. Yes, I think the sound, um, but it's the Lizzo, Lizzo song um, about like the Gucci. <laughs> um, anybody know the name of that song? Um, and they did a dance. So um, there's a lot of younger generation on TikTok like we talked about before, new adults. Um, and uh, they they might not see the library anywhere else. So you, you have to have the staff who's really willing to, you know, put themselves out there like that. But uh, that's, that's a possible way to get a new audience. Uh, next slide. It's plain again. <laughs> so then the other thing to consider is, you know, flyers and newsletters. If you don't already do them, I'm sure you might do them for other things. You can just get it right in there. But uh, just to make things more accessible, because not everybody does have access to the internet uh, and may see the things online. Uh, so uh, let me see. Uh, you know, Canva, like I mentioned before, it's free for nonprofits and you can make free flyers. You already have the templates there. Very easy to set that up. And that way, um, people who may not see things online, you know, older senior citizens or people with disabilities may be able to see flyers and newsletters that they can just pick up at the library. And you can also make sure to leave them at different community centers where people may be, parks, senior centers, et cetera. Uh, so next slide, I just uh, also had some examples of that. So again, um, you know, they have items of every single, every single thing you can check out, which can really grab uh, the interest of viewers and, you know, like, oh, I would like to check that piano out. So, you know, you can um, use those images to attract um, patrons. Next slide. And here's another one at the Gibsonville Public Library. So I just uh, did some, I said I did some research on what other libraries were doing. Next slide. So then um, as to partnerships and community uh, programs, you can reach out to schools, senior citizen centers, politicians, and others in your community to share your promotional materials and also to partner on programs, which I'm gonna talk about on the, on the next slide. So next one. Um, so some examples, you could have, of course, schools and groups like Tamalee has her class right now. And then you can partner with a group that specializes in the item that you're lending. For example, there's like sewing groups and a lot of libraries have sewing machines so they could come in and teach those classes. Then that's, a, you know, they might be able to do that for free because then they get more people to come to their, their group similar with gardening, we in our community have a community garden, so they can come in and they get more people to come to their garden. And um, it's always good, like, like was already said, to survey the community about what they need or what they would like to do with these items. So lastly, um, on the next slide, um, programming. Um, it's on the next, <laughs> it's on the next one. Next slide. So, um, Planning community programs, of course, is going to help more people come in and see your library of things um, by reaching out to your local library association. Like we're here at NY, um, New York, <laughs> New York um, Library Association. We can, you can see what programs other libraries have done, or you can just like look online. Of course, um, there's a lot of things on their websites and their social media. So what I did was uh, lastly research into that and see what kind of programs. So on the next slide, um, I just have three examples. So just um, at Princeton, New Jersey, 
they do this library of things pop up where they have people come in and try out the different items so then they can figure out what they want to check out. So like Chromebooks, hotspots, projectors, binoculars, Blu-ray players, and they can so actually be in there, try them out. And if they have any questions on how to use them, they can find that out at the library. So it's a four hour time slot. Uh, next slide. Um, similarly, uh, this one is on the left here, Jackson County, Oregon. Uh, they did um, a hands-on mystery lab, they called it. So that kind of adds adds for people to come in. It's like, what's, what's it going to be? Um, so you can try out uh, some of those items. So that seems to be a, a popular program that libraries um, do with their library of things, just to have a hands-on hour or a couple hours where people can come in. Next slide. And uh, lastly, uh, here's Brooklyn Public Library. Uh, like I said about the sewing, um, yeah, you can use the items in the library of things in this program. So the sewing machines that they have in the library of things, they use to um, have this program and let people come in. And then, you know, more people are going to want to check out. Actually, I saw when I looked up this um, event that all their sewing machines were currently checked out. There's a, there's a waiting list. So by having these types of programs, there's more people who are going to want to use your library of things and check out the items. So programs using your using your items um, in the library, and then they can check them out. So that's everything about promotion and outreach. You know, it's similar to other, other things you might do at your library, um, but you know, we, we did some research into how people had done that specifically for library of things. And that's the end of our presentation um, on the next slide. <laughs> if there's any questions, we are happy to answer them. And thank you for listening to our presentation. We hope you'll be inspired to go out and start your own library of things at your library. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was amazing. Thank you, Team Marigold. Okay. Um, any questions that we have for Team Marigold? Uh, cars available at library and things. <laughs> no, I'm actually on the uh, program. I it's saw only, somebody, only... I saw one library that was uh, had um, the Hot Wheels in their library of things. That's the closest they get to a car, I think. <laughs> I, I will say I saw online another country that was lending, doing a car sharing program, um, but it wasn't in the United States. It's probably insurance stuff more than anything, I would think. That, that, is that, that That's a problem. Um, somebody doesn't return a car. <laughs> That's an issue. Sounds like I'd be moving. <laughs> right. But I do think there was a car lending program at a library in Europe. Maybe, um, I don't remember which country I read about it. Dent Denmark or one of the European um, European countries had had car sharing. That's crazy. <laughs> I'm changing citizenship. <laughs> <laughs> what was the most interesting thing you guys saw? In, I mean, I know it's going to be different for everybody, but that you saw that gets loaned out. A blood pressure machine. <laughs> That's a big one in a lot of places. <laughs> I, I was surprised. I was like, well, now I know. <laughs> There's very, very random things but i do feel like the things that they touched on someone asked for because they were so specific mm -hmm. that someone would have to ask for that yeah i knew like gardening stuff was going to be a thing but then one library had like a hose was part of it and for some reason the hose really threw me off i was like well, i was so confused about the hose that was the one that really took me by surprise I know the next group also is talking about libraries of things and, and Jillian is on who was their mentor and she was from the Mid Hudson library system when I was a director there and Jillian had the coolest libraries of things always at her library she always had the best stuff they had like have a heart traps for wild animals and uh, camping equipment and I was always like I'm never gonna think of something before Jillian thinks of it. <laughs> we, just start, we just started a spice library. Yeah, which is awesome. Oh, cool. <laughs> I always thought I'd beat her on something, but I never did. She, she always came up with the ideas first. <laughs> wow. You guys did a I, fantastic job. Yeah, uh, thank you. I have a question for you all, um, but it's not related to your project. I just was always interested, why Team Marigold? <laughs> that has to do with Tamale. So Tamale, I remember in the beginning. Yes, so feed, I'll remember. take over real quickly. <laughs> we, grew, we had a, um, a garden at my library. We have a garden for the children's department and a garden for the teen space. And we planted marigolds last year and they were out of control. They were just so big and so plentiful that I have seeds <laughs> all over. I give out seeds to anybody that wants marigold seeds. And then 
I don't know what this marigold because I had seeds on my desk at that time. I have seeds under my desk. I have seeds <laughs> in the back of my desk. And I didn't even plant any marigold this year and they came back and they're going to come back with a vengeance. Yes. So that's where Team Marigolds came in. Love that. Sustainable gardening. It's fantastic. Yes. I, <laughs> I collect seeds now like a crazy lady. I have so many seeds. It's amazing. Thank you, everyone. Um, and then finally, we have Team Forward Thinking. Um, team Forward Thinking, the modern library is so much more than books or even ebooks. Libraries across the country circulate non traditional items from their libraries and sinks, provide access to equipment and training in their maker spaces, hire social workers to help at risk community members, and more. The process of deciding which services to introduce, getting staff on board, determining policy. And marketing these resources can seem daunting if you're starting from scratch. Um, we will create a toolkit for library staff to help them select and implement non-traditional resources and services in their library step by step. And their advisor is Julia Murphy, who is here and to join us. So thank you for being the team advisor for Team Forward Thinking. And the team members included Angel um, from the Queens Public Library, um, Nicole from the Buffalo Erie Town of Tonawanda Kenmore branch. Um, Nicole has a video that will be them speaking because um, they couldn't be here. Um, and then Richard from the Finkelstein Moral Memorial Library and then Tabitha from the Patrick Medford Public Library. All right, then turn it over to you all. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yes. I'm really sorry, I'm having an issue with my camera again. So it doesn't look like it would it will go on, but as long as you can hear me, we can move on. So I'm just gonna put the slides up. Okay, can everyone see? Yes. I'm sorry, but I don't have, there we go. Okay, here's our. So this is what uh, C just read to you all. Um, I'll just add to this. Um, basically, we were all aware of the many libraries that offer non-traditional services and resources. And we wanted to try and find libraries that had these services and resources and ask them if they'd be willing to share information with us. Uh, some of the things we asked them to share were policies that they created regarding the services, uh, any marketing documents that they might have used, uh, partnerships that they may have made externally, um, collaborations, which could be external or within the library with different departments, if there were any startup costs or what the cost would be to maintain these resources. We also added questions about the biggest obstacle they faced and what they wish they knew before they started. So these were our goals. We wanted to help librarians who are interested in adding non-traditional collections or services to their libraries. We wanted to inspire libraries to expand their services and collections in non-traditional ways. And we wanted to allow libraries to comparatively evaluate their non-traditional collections and services. So to do that, we created surveys to find the information. And our team member, Nicole, can't be here today, but she recorded her portion of the presentation and she's gonna talk about the surveys that we created. So we can't, I don't think we can hear the video. Um, when you share the screen, um, if you reshare, you'll get a little 
pop up and it says like you could share sound, make sure that you click that when you reshare so, the presentation. Should I stop sharing and then reshare? Yes. Yeah. And then you're going to reshare and then when the when the little pop up comes up, click share audio. There is no share audio popping up. You know, when you click share screen and um, when you click share screen and it shows you like, oh, which of the um, screens you're going to choose, that's where you see share audio at the, at, on that pop-up screen. It might be under advanced though. Mm -hmm. I'm see, not seeing maybe, the pop up. Could see maybe could, they, could they send you the, the video? Yeah, you yeah. See, I, yeah, I, I just put say. <laughs> I just put the link in the chat. If you can, that's just the link to the her MP4 file. So if you can just um, perfect, I'll do open that. it up. Yeah, give me one second. Thanks, see. Sorry. Yep. Oh no, you're fine. Okay. Give me a second. Everyone see my screen? Awesome. Hey everybody, Nicole here to talk about how we created a Google survey and we created it and dispersed it for people to take for our project. So using the Google survey was the path that we chose to try to get information from people about the non-traditional resources that we use. And there were some benefits and what I would like to call detractors, but the better phrase for it is learning experiences while using Google surveys to do this. So the benefits to using Google surveys is it's a familiar layout to most people. It is free to use which is really nice because when you use something like doodle polls, the free version has ads all over it and Google does not. It also will directly import all of your results into a spreadsheet. That way you can manipulate the data the way you need to. Um, it's easy for everybody to work on uh, if you're doing a group project because you can invite others to have access to it and make changes if they need to. It's easily to share. It's easily shareable through a link that you can send to other people. What we already discussed already, no ads because ad free is a much cleaner look to do something with. And it can also be filled out anonymous, anonymously if one chooses to fill it out or have the results taken that way. That wasn't the case for us because one of our questions actually was, um, what is your name and email so we can contact you with a second survey to get some more information with you so ours wasn't anonymous but it is an option if you wanted it to be that way so for what i would like to call learning experiences while using your google survey um there is a file upload feature for um responses to questions, which I had never realized was an option while making a Google survey before. And I was really excited to do this because it then put all the responses into separate folders. So that way it also organized all the files. So you didn't have to go through and sort through like a plethora of results and documents and you have, and knowing that, oh, it's about this topic, that topic, it can do that for you, which was great. How However, the drawback to this is that to use that option while using the Google surveys, you have to have a Gmail account. Um, and that is something that is not plainly stated when you enable this feature on your survey. So I went to go and activate it and there's nothing on there that says that when you go to choose that as a response option. And we did not realize that till later when people were saying they were having problems filling out links. And one might be thinking, well, why didn't you test out trying to fill out the survey before you sent it out? So I did, but the thing is at um, my work, 
we use Google accounts for several different things. So there's usually a Google account logged into the computer, which I did not think of at all, unfortunately, when having a coworker test it out and upload different documents to see how they sorted and that everything filled out correctly with the survey. So just a note about the Google surveys, if you want to use this feature, you have to have people comfortable with using a Gmail account to fill it out, which they may not be um, because of work, because it's a work-related project and they want to use their work emails or not provide an email to fill out the survey. So the next thing was getting the survey out to people. So the survey one, we posted it to listservs, Facebook groups, um, internally um, to different emails <laughs> at our job locations because there are several branches available to send it to within many of our systems. We got great responses. We got a lot of responses, honestly, which we were really excited about. And with that, they said as well that they would be willing to fill out that second survey. <laughs> which was great. However, survey two, we hit some hiccups. Um, we sent out emails to people with a second link to take a second survey. It had a slow response rate. Um, we reached out to people individually. At the beginning of sending out the second survey, we did very briefly hit an issue, which I discussed previously, which was needing to have a Gmail account to log in, but that was resolved. Um, fairly quickly and taken out so that way people did not have to put in a Gmail account. So because we had issues getting some results back, we sent out a second round of emails, just a reminder being like, hey, sending out the survey to you. Um, we also used Nyla as a resource to see if they could get us a couple more survey responses back and had, had them send it out for us and it just, we did not get the same response rate, which was really interesting because we had such a good response rate for the first survey. Um, and these were people that said they wanted to take a second survey. So what would be helpful, I think, would be instead of sending multiple surveys sometimes, would be to just send one survey and get the information from people while they want to look at and send you information. So I'm going to sign off and somebody else will start presenting. Have a great day, everybody. I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time getting past. Uh, click the full screen because like to get that out. You're not seeing my full screen? We're just seeing the video still. I can't get out of the video link. Click escape. Okay, so now we're back. Everybody can see the regular. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Yeah. Okay, so now we'll talk about some of the survey results. So the initial survey, we had great response. We had 122 libraries respond saying that they were willing to uh, take part in our project. Unfortunately, the second follow-up survey where we were asking for more in-depth information, we only got 20 responses. So um, some of the categories of non-traditional library resources um, that we saw the most of were Library of Things, Makerspaces, adult education, seed libraries. Um, there was an interesting one with iPads with augmentative and alternative communication apps uh, for people who have trouble uh, speaking. I thought that was a really interesting and specific one. There's also an education resource center just for homeschooling. 
Um, so they have um, programs and materials and a whole center just for uh, homeschooling families. There were also uh, health services and social workers and financial literacy. Um, some of the initial survey results had some interesting things that we didn't get additional information on, but they were things like notaries, repair stations, community gardens, food pantries, and bookmobiles. So one of the questions we asked in the survey was to include any obstacles. Um, and the major obstacle most people said was marketing and just getting the word out to the community about whatever this resource or service was that they still had, even though these services had been in place for a while, they still had people coming in that didn't know it was available. Um, storage space came up a lot for people who had library of things or maker spaces. That's always, um, always an issue. Uh, cost was another issue, depending on what the service was, um, whether or not they had money in the budget or needed to get a grant to make it happen. Um, another one of the top things was time. Uh, everyone underestimated the amount of time it was going to take to organize and prepare for the services and resources that they were offering at their libraries. And I think uh, the top three was probably uh, staff training. So a lot of the uh, libraries mentioned that the time it took to train their staff, um, either for maker spaces or for uh, checking out library of things or for other um, services they offered took a lot longer than they thought. Um, this one was regarding library of things. A lot of the libraries said they didn't budget enough for replacement parts. So when things get damaged or go missing, um, it was important to have some money on the side so that they could replace things as they went. And an interesting note for the homeschooling was that the, uh, the homeschooling families wanted library space in addition to just resources and, and the collection and the materials. And they weren't expecting that. Um, also regarding adult education, the staff mentioned that they underestimated the time it would take to help teach the older adults technology terms and vocabulary, and um, they underestimated the amount of time uh, they would need to practice their skills. So most popular items, this really refers to the Library of Things category. Um, I just thought these were interesting and, and really um, varied depending on the community that these libraries were in. So museum passes was definitely number one. Hotspots was up there. Portable DVD players, metal detectors, VR goggles, state park passes, Chromebooks, and Nintendo Switch. That wasn't very surprising. What was surprising was a record player and American Girl dolls. Snowshoes, I'm guessing it snows a lot where that library is. Um, and then yard games and things. So we took all this information and we created a wiki with it. And now uh, Tabitha will talk to you about the wiki. Thanks, Angel. Okay, can everyone see the screen? Yes. Yes, yes. thanks. Um, so to present our results, we chose to create a wiki. Um, we created it using MediaWiki, which is free and open source and is, you might recognize, is the same software used on Wikipedia. And we are hosting our wiki on DreamHost, which is a popular web hosting provider. And we chose DreamHost because I was familiar using it. Um, and so here is the URL. If you want to take a look, it's librariesofthefuture.wiki. Um, so the main page has an overview, a little overview of our project, and then contains links to the different categories and pages we put together. Um, so this will take you to like all the pages, all the categories. Um, and these are individual pages that had a lot of content or on them. Um, 
the content we have is a combination of information we received uh, from the survey results, including some sample documents that libraries sent to us, like, let's see. This is um, someone's information about their library of things. Um, and also some independent research. So like this is um, some links of like useful articles or guides that we found on our own. Um, and you can, if you wanted to search for something, you can do so. This was one of the examples of um, a program that was a little unusual that someone was doing. So what are the benefits of using a wiki? Uh, we wanted something that could be changed and added to indefinitely um, in case we wanted to maintain the wiki after the class ended. Uh, it's available on the internet um, to anyone with a simple link. Uh, we all had our own logins for the wiki um, and we can add as many users as we want. So if in the future someone wanted to add their own library's information on there, we could make them an account and they could do so. Um, and we wanted the sample documents to be available to viewers. Uh, so we're able to upload them directly to the wiki and have them hosted here rather than hosting them on one of our personal accounts or, you know, linking to the library's website and hoping that they don't, you know, change the link. Um, in addition, I had shown you how we had chosen to structure it, but the wiki format allows you to organize your content as you see best and to rearrange things fairly easily. Um, there are a couple of drawbacks. One is cost. There is a small monthly fee required to maintain a website on DreamHost, but um, the main one was that there is a bit of a learning curve to using MediaWiki. Uh, it did require some tech skills to get set up, and the most effective way to edit it is by using the source editor, which involves like a simplified markup language. Um, so if you're familiar with either editing HTML uh, or for the web or with cataloging, I don't think it would be an issue, but if you're new to that type of editing, it can be difficult to get used to. Um, so once again, if you'd like to take a look, it's librariesofthefuture.wiki and it's live. You can see everything we have on there. Um, and now we are going to go to Richard. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, can, I, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, is my part of the... Yeah, I can, okay. I can advance the slides for you if you want. All right, so this part um, of the project, uh, fourth and last part I worked on, I um, had the responsibility to look for the um, contents, uh, such as the uh, links that are in our uh, wiki to the uh, makerspace technologies, the uh, adult education, social work, health literacy, library of things, sustainability, financial literacy. Uh, and um, the second part is the non-traditional uh, actual um, program in motion to be uh, slated to be st uh, started in September. That is a program that I'm working on uh, at the Finkelstein Memorial Library. Uh, so um, could you go to the next slide? Okay, so uh, basically I've mentioned this, I searched for public libraries with the non-traditional programs that we're looking for and uh, uh, found the links that we needed so that we could have it on the wiki. Uh, when someone searches, they find examples of each of the different topics that I mentioned. Um, so Tabitha, would you go to the next slide? So um, again, I mentioned this ahead of time. We are hoping to uh, implement this in um, September at Finkelstein Memorial Library. This is uh, where I work. This is part of East Rampo Central School District. And uh, please go to the next. Uh, so basically, uh, we will be choosing candidates who are East Rampo Central School District residents 
uh, in their mid 20s or older. Uh, we call the program a second chance to earn their high school diploma. This is a real uh, high school diploma, not a GED. It will be an online program. Uh, and um, the difference uh, between this uh, and uh, let's say other programs where people, persons have access to the um, uh, a website and simply do their work is that uh, we, we we have uh, the means and we uh, intend to continue to uh, find the means to provide half of the tuition for the students. Uh, so it is an accredited school. And uh, again, I mentioned the tuition uh, payments and the library will provide space for doing the work, uh, the uh, computers and rooms available. And um, if Tabitha, please go to the next. So our goal is uh, to help, it sounds perhaps a bit um, grandiose, but, uh, but uh, you'll, as we go through, you'll see why I'm saying that, help people who are living in poverty getting out of there, uh, people who did not graduate from high school, have difficulty with BOCES, we're not competing with BOCES, so we're doing absolute best that those people we're serving are beyond BOCES days, and uh, uh, we are the next possibility for them. Again, I mentioned they're mid 20s, so they've passed the general entry into BOCES program. And also those who need assistance to pay for this program. Uh, Davitha, the next, please. So uh, to sort of document what are we saying in terms of uh, alleviating uh, from poverty levels, this is a report from uh, New York State um, uh, controller, Dinapoli, points, points out that uh, nearly 14% of New Yorkers live in poverty, uh, surpassing national average. So we believe uh, that we, from the public libraries, and uh, our purpose, one of our purposes is to take this further beyond this library to see how other public libraries will be willing to participate in New York, hopefully we'll take it beyond that too. So if we can do this, if we can help those who cannot, who pass the age of getting the uh, high school diploma on their own and not become desperate and just live day to day in their poverty, not willing to make an effort uh, because they don't see a means, so if we can bring this to them, we can help them and that can help uh, New York State, and that can go also beyond into the world. As we hear from the United Nations, uh, we all can make a difference, a little, but still can make a difference in terms of helping those who are poor and uh, hunger, hungry in our world. So, Tabitha, next one, please. Uh, so, to achieve our goals, um, uh, well, to basically, we are participating and. Um, uh, New York, uh, United Nations, uh, let's say, uh, goals. Goal one is to end poverty wherever we can. Goal three, ensure health. Of course, as we help those who are um, unable to uh, get out of poverty, we will be helping them have healthier lives also. Goal four is the actual specific uh, focus, ensure inclusive and equitable quality of education, promote lifelong learning. So we do that in January, the library, but this is an added uh, effort in addition to having had uh, a um, program to help a uh, person from other countries learn English. We have had uh, for a decade and a half here at Franco Scene Library. So we are expanding to one level further. Uh, helping people learn a little bit of English is great. I don't mean just a little bit, but to learn English is great, but helping them go to the next level uh, can make a very big difference in their lives. Uh, Tabitha, the next, please. So um, what we'll, we'll be looking for the applicants, what we'll be looking from them is the address stating their information and generally why they feel they qualify for the program, how will it help them, and uh, also uh, state uh, uh, their need to assist for assistance to pay for this program. Uh, Tabitha, the next. Uh, so evaluating this letter through the library, 
will help us uh, determine who's able, who has the aptitude to complete uh, this education and uh, also uh, meeting the demographics uh, criteria. Uh, Tabitha? So to make this possible, funding, we have earned uh, a, a grant from uh, OCLS. And also we have requested grants from our state senator, uh, Bill Weber, and also Assemblyman John McGowan, who serve these are the districts uh, where the Finkelstein Library is. And we will continue uh, to apply for grants uh, to fund uh, this uh, program. Uh, and we believe that we can get that uh, from our, uh, our elected officials. So uh, second part, the second part in terms of um, how are we implementing this, we will use a, um, our technology room, which is used for computer classes. When they're not in use, it will be available for these uh, for this program for continuing uh, education to learn and pass, learn that uh, high school uh, diploma online. And Tabitha, the last, I think, I guess that was it. Yes. So questions. Uh, this was it. So we hope. Uh, that you find this program useful and uh, look for more information about it. Contact us at Finkelstein Library. We're happy to participate with you. We'd like this to be a, an example of a project that can be used to make a difference in New York State and beyond. Th that's it. We're done. <laughs> questions. <laughs> Thank you. Any Thank you. questions? Got through all the presentations. Any closing thoughts, team, forward thinking? I think you guys did a great job. It's a it's a a cool thing that you took on more than just looking at one kind of unconventional thing that libraries are doing. I like the sort of holistic approach because that's what libraries do is is look for. I mean, even Library of Things, right, is born out of this desire to like what could we do that we're not doing that would be useful to our communities? And um, certainly the program Richard was talking about would be useful to our communities. It's the same way I think Nyla is working on a grant right now with a group that's looking at alternate pathways to librarianship um, to try and remove barriers to access to the degree. Uh, Cause not everybody working in libraries has a degree and uh, part of that's because we make it difficult. So I think you guys did a really nice job at, at looking at kind of the whole picture and, and thinking outside the box. Any final thoughts before we close out? I just want to say on behalf of Nyla, I am very appreciative of all of you for, I know that this started off in a bumpy way. Um, I was tasked with kind of re restarting it when I got here just a year and a half ago. Um, and it was one of a million things I was I was told to do. So um, I, I know it was not the smoothest transition. And I really appreciate all of you bearing with us and really engaging with us. C has done a fantastic job, kind of, it got better when C, when I, when I got C involved than it was when I was doing it. So <laughs> I'm, I'm super appreciative of C and I, all of our mentors and faculty and um, all of you for really being patient and going through this. I hope that you ended up feeling like it was a worthwhile experience for you. And we want you to know that moving forward, as we keep this program going now, there is a cohort of people in the past and there's your group and there's groups moving forward. And we really want to create a sort of community out of this to give you guys resources, but also to hopefully have you come back as faculty and as advisors and mentors for other groups, because who knows better what this is like than all of you who were involved in it and helped us reimagine it. So we've taken a lot from all of the commentary you've given us to try and improve it for the next group. Um, and I know that's bittersweet because it's like, well, the next group will have it better than, than we did. But that's partly what we're always trying to do, right, is improve and make it better moving forward. So I, I really appreciate all of you and all of the work you did and um, know that Nyla is uh, here for you and uh, will also be, be bothering you to help us be there for other people in the future. So we hope we'll get to see you at Nyla events. And um, we hope that you had a really fulfilling experience and we definitely learned a lot from working with you. So just thank you uh, to all of you for, 
for your patience and your enthusiasm. Yes, thank you. Um, and to close out, um, as I mentioned before, I know I can't believe it's been a year as well. Um, I will be um, cutting up these all these recordings and putting them on the website. Uh, please make sure to send me over your presentations. And if you're present, I'm pretty sure all your presentations included the links to each of your resources. So I'll make sure that's also posted on the website as well. Um, and when that's up, I'll also send over the final survey just to get a whole picture of your experience here and also um, your feedback on the latter half of the programs um, as I'm building the schedule for next year. And um, before we all head out, um, if you're able to all turn on your camera, that would be amazing if I'm going to take a little screenshot of everyone. And you could just smile. Um, mm -hmm. And wait one second. Oops, I forgot to move this to the other screen. Please hold. <laughs> we need hold music, see. Are you, are you going to give us a countdown? Yes. <laughs> okay. yes. We'll have to do that. Got to be prepared. <laughs> I'm, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Getting the hang of this. Okay. <laughs> New. All right. So. I'll send you a picture, see. <laughs> Ready, set, smile. Yay, that worked. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. And you'll all be getting your packages in the mail shortly. So yes. be on the look for those. Cute. Well, thank you. That's it, y'all. <laughs> yes. Thank you, everyone. And thank, thank you, Steve, you. because you, you helped out a lot because I have a lot of questions and you answered thank all you. of them. Thank of you. Yes. He's the best. And yes, I'll email all, all the links as well. So all right. have a great day, everybody. everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Congratulations. Bye. Yes, congratulations, thank everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>